We're going to be looking today at this particular portion of Scripture, and uh, I was going to just actually move into chapter 9 because I've tried, tried to just put in um, snapshots of each chapter, but as I was reading through it, I was normally going to simply um, put some things together and then move into chapter 9. Chapter 9 um, is actually the um, conversion of Saul, and... Uh, I didn't want to just move into that. Uh, I'd like to do that by itself. And so I was reading the verses before us, and, and the Lord was speaking to my heart some things, and I thought, well, you know what? I, I'll just stay with this today. And so we're going to be looking at the uh, conclusion of chapter 8 by looking at verses 26 through 40. And so I'll begin reading at verse 26 and uh, read to verse 29, and we'll get into our study this morning. We're looking at the subject if you believe. So beginning at verse 26 down, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. And so last time we were together in the book of Acts, we were looking at the spread of the gospel, how the gospel had begun to spread from the city of Jerusalem. Remember with me that Jesus had given a command, he had given a command to his disciples in Matthew 28. He had said in verses 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so they were to go to all nations, and they were to teach them even as he had commanded. Well, later he gave greater insight into how this command would be obeyed, how it could be observed now, how would these men who have never traveled be able to obey this kind of command? Well, in Acts 1, verse 8, he had said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So with God's word and God's power, they were going to be empowered to evangelize the world. And after Pentecost had occurred, this is what has been happening. You see, on Pentecost, the disciples shared the gospel in Jerusalem. They established a community there. They began to do the work of ministry. Now, Jesus had said that through the power of God, they would be his witnesses. And this would make them effective in their ministry. So they were effective. Luke says that they had favor with the people and also that they were greatly esteemed. So throughout Acts, we see the impact of the Word and the preaching of the Word. When baptized by the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit and power were both evidenced, and thousands were being saved, miracles, signs, and wonders were present. Now, Paul would later give insight into how God affected such amazing change. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, he said, Our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know, what kind of men we were among you for your sakes. And so the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, transformed lives. Obedience to the command was impacting. Well, persecution arose. And one thing was evident, because as they had been taken and were being persecuted and began to share concerning the reason they were doing these things, it simply said in Acts 4.13 that they had been with Jesus. And so persecution arose, at first in a mild form, but it began to grow in intensity. It became so severe that they began to, to scatter throughout Judea into Samaria. Now Jesus has said to preach in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and now we see the gospel as it begins to move out even further. In chapter 8, we saw Philip preaching the gospel in this region called Samaria, and now we see the gospel as it begins to move to the end of the earth. Multitudes have listened to the gospel. Multitudes have witnessed amazing miracles. Many are being saved. Many were being baptized. So Peter and John 
had come from Jerusalem and they prayed for them that they might receive the Spirit. After dealing with false conversions, they returned to Jerusalem. And as they returned, they began to preach in many Samaritan villages. And that's where we're picking up our study. So as all of this is taking place, verse 26 simply says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then he has this, uh, this statement, This is desert. So we're going to see Philip sharing the gospel with a high-ranking Ethiopian official. Philip, as I've mentioned several times now, is the only one in Scripture ever referred to as an evangelist. We don't hold that office ourselves. Some do, but not all of us do. We may not hold the office of evangelist, but all of us are to do the work of one. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul said, you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions. And he went on to say, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. So we all in one form or another already do the work of an evangelist. We share with people the things that matter most to us. And so in the case of Philip, he's sharing the things of the Lord. Now revival is occurring. It's occurring in actual life is occurring in and a, a great excitement is occurring in Samaria. But Philip has been instructed to go to the desert. That's interesting to me. And I was thinking about this. Things were happening. Philip was seeing people saved. Philip was seeing people um, baptized in the Spirit. Philip saw miracles. He was performing miracles. The, the Lord God was moving. And yet the Lord says to him, you need to go to a place that is dry. You need to go to the desert. And that's what is told to us here. He says, go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then we're told, this is desert. Sometimes the Lord may be moving in your life. Sometimes he may be doing something to you in a special way, through you in a special way. And then he moves you. And he sends you someplace you don't necessarily want to go. When I got saved back in, in 1970, when I got saved, I was you know, I was excited serving the Lord, but within three months, I went to my own personal desert for the first time. I, I had to go into the military. I, I went to the army, and there I am. I'm being moved out of Calvary Chapel. I'm being moved out of, of, of a great work of the Lord. There's so many young people getting saved. It was so exciting. There were so many wonderful things taking place. We were, we were going to to, to Bible studies uh, several times a week. We were holding times of prayer and, and, and worship in, in homes. And it, it was just a, an amazing, refreshing time for me to do that as a brand new believer. And, and now I'm being moved into the desert. I had to go into the military. I had been drafted. I went into the service. And now I'm at Fort Ord up, in, up close to Monterey. And, and I have to tell you, it was, it was not a, a, a joy-filled moment for me. I still remember getting in on that bus in L.A. and, and going up north and, 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 and arriving later in the evening. And, and there I am in this barracks, and I'm thinking, man, I, di I didn't want this. I wasn't the happiest of all people and all of that. But there was a guy there, and this, there were more than one, actually, but this one guy named Larry. And uh, Larry and I got to know each other. I had a friend named Bill. Bill and I and Larry began to know each other. And, and uh, you know, we were going through basic training together. And, and as we did so, I had an opportunity to get to know this young man. And as I was speaking to him, I remember sharing with him and my friend Bill. And we're brand new Christians ourselves, but we shared with Larry. And uh, in that barracks one evening, I asked him, do you want to receive the Lord? And he said, yes, he bowed his head. We prayed with him, and he gave his heart to Christ. Now, after that, I'm, I'm shipped out. I go out to, uh, to Georgia. I end up in, in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, I don't see this guy. I, have, I didn't see him. And then one day I'm here in, in Ontario. And, and uh, as I'm there in Ontario, and I'm just walking around, and we had quite a number of people on the campus and all, this guy walks up to me, and he says, David. And I go, yeah. And I didn't recognize him. And he says, hi, I'm Larry. Larry Schwalm. And I looked at him and I, I said, Larry. And he said, yeah, we went through basic together. 
And I said, yeah. And he said, I just wanted, you know, he said, I heard that you were having this thing here. He lived close by. And he said, I thought I'd come and just say hello and let you know everything's going fine with me. I'm serving the Lord. And so sometimes you're moved from some place where everything's happening to a place where you think nothing is happening. And it turns out God has moved you there because there's somebody who wants you to minister to. So never, ever get discouraged if you move from one place that seems to be happening to a place where nothing seems to be happening because you may be the reason there's somebody there waiting that God is going to use you to go and reach that person. And that's what we're seeing take place here in, in the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. You see, he's sent and he's moved out and he needs to go out and speak to somebody who the Lord has set aside so that he can reach. Notice how it says in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go down from here. So in obedience, he does. He, he arises and he goes. Now, he could have been reluctant, but God was after someone. Peter and John had returned to Jerusalem. They were preaching in Samaritan villages. As they did so, Philip was sent on a journey of his own. Now, notice an angel of the Lord had told him to go to Gaza, and again, which is desert. Earlier, we had seen an angel release the apostles from jail in chapter 5. Here, he issues a command for Philip to, to go south into Gaza. There were two roads at that time that would go in that direction that were main, main roads. One of those roads would lead to an inhabited area, but the other went towards the desert. So instead of moving into the more populous region, he actually went into the desert area. And once again, instead of going to a place that was promising, he went to a desert. Again, I, as I was preparing this, I was returning I was remembering certain things, and, and when we had begun our ministry, and first we were a home Bible study in Ontario, then we began to rent places. Eventually, we began to rent the, uh, the school, Ontario High School, and the Lord was beginning to move in all of that. We had asked Pastor Chuck to come out on one occasion when we were at Ontario Christian, and I was very excited about that, and a couple of years later, we had asked him to come out to do something, and so we were at that point meeting in the Ontario High School. And um, I still remember that the school was so crowded that people were sitting on the floor and, and they were, you know, in the, uh, it sat 1,200 people. They were sitting on the floor and some were sitting uh, in everywhere, actually filled up all the chairs. And uh, I was very blessed to see that happen, you know. And um, as we were walking out, I'll never forget these words I heard come out of Pastor Chuck, as, as we we're walking out and we we're standing in the parking lot for just a second, and under his breath, he said something that I'll never forget. Under his breath, he said, I hate you, David. No, he didn't say that. Under his breath, he said, who would have ever thought Ontario? And I thought the same thing. Who would have ever thought Ontario? Because there had been a Calvary Chapel that had been planted before we planted ours. It didn't fly. But this time it did. And Chuck saw that. And again, sometimes you're moved into a place that may not seem to be promising. But God is there. And God has a work that he wants to do. It's a blessing to see how the Lord works to reach the one in need. And we see that the Lord has an appointment now with an Ethiopian official. Now, when the angel of the Lord said, go toward the south, that was a divine direction for the purpose of presenting the gospel to this man. Now, Philip had been used by the Lord to minister to multitudes while in the region of Samaria. And many had come to faith in Jesus Christ as he had preached. He could be reluctant to preach after such an experience, but he is still sent. And that's going to strengthen his faith as he sees that Jesus seeks not only multitudes, but he also seeks out the one Jesus spoke of the individual who is in need of salvation. He spoke of the man who was searching for his one lost sheep. He spoke of the woman who was searching for her lost coin. He spoke of a father who was longing for the return of his lost son. Jesus, the one who stopped by a toll booth and told a man named Matthew to follow him. He went to the, a city of Samaria to speak to a lonely woman at a well. He went across the Sea of Galilee to reach a man who was demon-possessed. 
And each of these individuals were used to tell many of who Jesus is. And so the church is something that God will do a work in, but it sometimes begins with just one person. When I began this ministry many years ago now, I had served as an assisting pastor in another fellowship. I was ordained in serving, and I resigned my position. I held a Bible study after I had resigned, and people asked me, what are you going to do, and uh, where are you going to go? And I remember as I was there at my home having a study, and they said, you're no longer serving in this place. What are you going to do? I said to them, I'm going to go to my sister-in-law Patty's house and uh, teach her on Sunday until I find a church that I can attend. The reason the church began was really for a single person. It was for Patty. It was so that Patty might have a Bible study and Patty and her roommate would, would, would attend. That's why you do things. You, you don't go out and do things because you think that somehow this will be a stepping stone to something greater. Just do the thing in front of you. Just do the thing that you can do. Bible studies, when I began Bible studies, I started just because my mom and my dad needed a Bible study. This church actually began in advance of that event that I just mentioned, when my brother Frank got saved and he needed a Bible study. And that's why I drove from Norwalk and I would drive to Ontario. It took me 45 minutes to get there. And I went for the one person. You always go for the one. Now, sometimes there are great groups and sometimes there are small groups and sometimes there's just one person. But you go because God sends you. And that's what's happening here with Philip. Philip has seen the Spirit moving. He's seen and performed miracles. The Holy Spirit has baptized multitudes. There are people who are getting saved. There's, there's this great life and great joy and great excitement. And then the Lord says, now you leave that and you go to some place that's a desert. And you move into that area. And at first you might say, why would I do that? Why would I want to do that? Things are happening here. Why would I go somewhere else? Well, because there's, a, uh, there's an uh, Ethiopian official there that I've got a, an appoint, appointment with, just the way that he had, Jesus had had an appointment with that woman at the well, when he said, I must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because there was a woman at the well that he was going to minister to, and you see the same kind of thing taking place here. And so the people that were reached in the other things I mentioned were people who also spread the good news, and now we're going to see the Lord reach somebody who is a very high church official, who became a very high official in the ministry of the Lord. So in verse 27, it says, he arose and went. So without argument, Philip did exactly what he was commanded to do. Now, notice verse 27, he arose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. And so this man is spoken of an, as an Ethiopian. It speaks of him being a black man. Ethiopia is also spoken of in Scripture as Cush. And Cush is actually referring to blackness. This is a black man. He was a eunuch of great authority. He is a member of the court. Now, he's spoken of as a eunuch. Now, I'm going to share this for just a moment because it matters. We, we read about eunuchs in Scripture, and normally the word eunuch is used to speak of a man who has been castrated. But it doesn't necessarily mean that this man was castrated. Genesis 39 verse 1 speaks of a man by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar is referred to as a eunuch, and yet he was married this is a man who is referred to as a eunuch. He's a man of great power, which means that he's a, the minister of finance for Ethiopia. This very powerful man who's referred to as, an, as a eunuch has, has come to Jerusalem to worship. He's obviously searching. He was seeking to know the true and the living God, but he's returning to Ethiopia spiritually empty. Now, he had come to worship. The exact feast he was observing is not given. 
His time in Jerusalem didn't completely satisfy his spiritual hunger. Now, considering the spiritual state of the nation, he would have left unsatisfied. Again, he went, he went to worship, he's returning, but he's still empty. And it sounds very much like the, the way many people may, may return after a church service. They, re, they go to a religious service, but they, they leave empty. They're, they're left unsatisfied. They're hungry for truth, uh, but, but they, they don't hear it. This man was hungry for truth, and that made him uh, in a great position to receive Messiah. And there he is in verse 28, sitting in his chariot, and he's reading Isaiah the prophet. Now, in the midst of all of this, God is preparing the minister of finance for salvation. God saw his hunger, and he sent Philip there to share with him. In Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13, it says, You will call upon me and go and pray to me. I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And so this man is in a great position to be saved. Notice verse 29. The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. The Spirit said, notice how, how he makes it clear that it's the Spirit who speak into him. You see that kind of phrase in chapter 10, verse 19. You see it again in chapter 11, verse 2, as well as chapter 13, verse 2. It's speaking of the person of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit prompts his heart to move, and he did. God had prepared this man's heart, and it must have thrilled an evangelist like Philip to be able to go and speak to somebody about the Lord. You see, first he was directed to a desert, and now he's directed to a man. And both the desert and the man are dry. But Philip is bringing water, the water of life. Verse 30 says, Philip ran to him, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. So instead of hesitating and doubting, Philip hurries over to the man and begins to speak to him. Now, there must have been bodyguards around this man, but Philip was able to approach him. Once again, you may be surprised at how many people are open to hear about Jesus. Sometimes we think no one's interested, but that isn't true. Many are hungry for truth. Many desire purpose and hope. I remember being at a, a church service, and, and my cousin, his name was Ray, was with us at the church service. Ray lived up in Corcoran at that time. He came to visit the family, and so we took him to church. It was a Sunday morning, Phil, and... and uh, my, my cousin didn't show many, much evidence of being interested in the things of the Lord. I would share with him and all of that as we do. But he would just kind of just smile and nod his head. And I still remember going to church and him, him going with me. And then the, the, the pastor gave an invitation. And as I was seated there and the Spirit of the Lord began to minister, he, he, he ministered to my heart. And he said, uh, when the invitation was given, he said, um, tell your cousin Ray that you'll go up with him. If, uh, if he wants to get saved. And I remember arguing with the Spirit in my mind. I said, no, uh, he's not going to want to go. And I also remember saying, anyway, I've been saved for two and a half years already. Uh, why would I go up again? I don't want people to think I'm getting saved. I still remember thinking that. And so I didn't say a word to my, to my cousin. I didn't think he was interested. And I didn't want to humble myself. And so we got home and we were sitting at the kitchen table and and Ray is sitting across from me, and, and he looks at me, and he says, you know, today when that invitation was given, I was waiting for you to say, I'll go up with you. And I, I started learning lessons at that early age in the Lord that sometimes you may feel that nobody's interested, when in fact God is preparing hearts. And, and, and in the case of Philip, when the Spirit said, go and attach yourself to that chariot, go and speak to that man, even though that man was a great man of great authority, there would have been an entourage of people who were with him. He would have had bodyguards because he was a man of, of high ranking in Ethiopia. None of that deterred him. The Spirit said to go, and he did, and he went and spoke to him. And so as he begins to speak to him, notice verse 30 how it says here, Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and to sit with him. How can I understand unless someone guides me? Because he asked that question, do you understand? You see, the man wouldn't know the meaning of the passage. And so he says it, how can I unless someone guides me? 
It shows us something. It shows us that this man was humble. He had a humble character. He obviously was religious. He's obviously a very powerful man. Philip is a stranger. He's not rich. He's not powerful. But in spite of this, the Ethiopian humbly confesses he needs a teacher. The passage he's reading has arrested his attention. He wants to know what it means. Philip is an evangelist. He's filled with the Spirit. He's filled with wisdom. He's conversant with the passage. And he can provide an answer. In this instant, the evangelist became a teacher. Now the Ethiopian says, how can I unless someone guides me? That's an important point I want to develop for a second. The Bible is a closed book to those who don't know the Lord. There are people who will tell you that. If you share your faith at all, they'll say, I've read the Bible. It makes no sense to me. I've read the Bible. It doesn't appeal to me. I read it. I don't really get it at all. The Bible is a closed book to those who are not saved. So this Ethiopian, in reading that passage, isn't getting spiritual insight into it because he doesn't have the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, people who aren't Christians can't understand these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them because only those who have the Spirit can understand what the Spirit means. And so you can share with people the gospel, but it takes the Spirit of God to awaken them to its truth. They can read it on their own, and sometimes the Holy Spirit will speak in such a way through the Word and convict them, and they can read and be saved. But under normal circumstances, it takes someone to come and preach them to them and share with them. And so the preaching of the Word and conviction of the Spirit is what God uses to draw those who aren't saved. Nature and conscience make us aware that there's a God, but the Word of God reveals Him to us. So Philip needs to explain the passage to him that he might see who it is pointing to. And it takes the Holy Spirit to draw this man to Christ. In John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. So the man's response reveals the humility of his heart as well as its hunger. He invites Philip to be seated with him. And that must have thrilled Philip for this opportunity. In verse 32, it says the place in, uh, in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Who is this prophet writing about, is the question. The eunuch answered, Philip, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Who is the prophet writing about, himself or some other man? Now, this is a question many in Israel have wrestled with. Some thought that Isaiah was speaking of himself. Some of the rabbis during that day were teaching that it spoke of Jeremiah, or it was speaking of one of the righteous, one of the prophets who had suffered. But many others thought that the passage spoke of Messiah. Philip obviously knew who was being spoken of in this passage. I, was, I, was, I listened to a Jewish man recently who was saying that in, in synagogue reading that uh, Isaiah 52 will be read, but they don't read Isaiah 53. They skip off into Isaiah 54. They still reject, even in synagogues to this day, that Jesus is Messiah. They skip over Isaiah 53. Well, this Ethiopian eunuch is saying, who's being spoken of here? This man or some other man? And so what happens? I want you to see this. Verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. Philip was filled with faith and power in God's word. 
and he clearly shared Jesus. He started there and began to present to him who Messiah is. <clears throat> and that principle seems to be lost on many in pulpits today as they skip over passages or don't teach the word of God. But that's been the strength of Calvary Chapel Ministries for many years, teaching the word of God verse by verse and looking at what it says and how do you apply that. And so he began there. You see, the whole Bible actually points to Jesus. In John 5, 39, he had said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify, Jesus said, about me. And, and so we study to be able to minister in that manner with a systematic knowledge. Philip was able to present the passage and point to the Savior. In 1 Peter 3, 15, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. That's why you read and that's why you study. That's why you memorize. That's why you spend time in the word of God with others. It's so that you might be equipped so that someday you may be on a bus, a train, a plane, or with a friend as you were driving somewhere and the topic of Christ may come up and you're prepared. Philip was prepared and by the power of the Holy Spirit was able to communicate to this man about this passage. It says in verse 36, now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It seems obvious that, that Philip shared how to have a relationship with God and, and told them who Jesus is. He would have spoken to him about what Jesus did, what his life was like, how he died on a cross, how he was buried, how the third day he rose from the dead, how he ministered, how he sent the Holy Spirit. He would have told him all of those things. He would have spoken to him of the command that Jesus said, go into the world, preach the gospel, and baptize people. And so as he did so, this, this man understood that to be a, a recognized follower of Christ was to make an open declaration and so he wants to be baptized. He knew that baptism, because he had been taught this, is a, a picture of the new life that you have in Jesus. It's like what Paul later was to say in, in Romans 6 when he said in verses 3 through 5, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection. This man says, what hinders me? Now somewhere down the road, as he was hearing to the word, hearing the word of God, he came to believe. And in the midst of the desert, they came to some water. In the midst of the dryness, they found a place of refreshment. So he asked, what hinders me from being baptized? I want to follow Jesus. And before all of these people, I want to be baptized. I don't know how many of you are aware of a, a, a woman by the name of Sandy McIntosh. Sandy McIntosh is the wife of uh, Mike McIntosh, who for many years pastored the church of Horizon, called Horizon Church. It was originally Calvary Chapel, San Diego. They changed it to Horizon, and he ministered there over 40 years. And Sandy was sharing how she came to faith in Christ, which I found very interesting, so I'll share it with you very briefly. She shared that even after she and her husband Mike had had problems, they had actually divorced, and, and he had gotten saved, and he was beginning to try and win her to Christ that he said, you need to come and hear this band that's playing. And they went to a place called Pirate's Cove. And she said, she's there, and all of these young people are there. And, and there was somebody singing a song. But what it was, was it was actually a baptism. She's unsaved. She says, but I decided, I think I'll get baptized. She, she got in line. And as she's standing in line, the guy behind her says to her, oh, you're getting baptized. He starts a conversation. And she says, yeah. He says, uh, do you know why you're getting baptized? And she says, well, because everybody else is. And he says, do you know the Lord? And she says, no, not really. 
And Sandy's testimony is that in the line on her way to be baptized is where she got saved. I think that's beautiful. In that line, this guy led her to the Lord, and then she got saved. You know, yeah, I think, I think that's great. So when you, when you follow the Lord, you receive water baptism, even as we did just recently. What is the condition to be water baptized? Well, notice, if you believe, verse 37, if you believe with all of your heart, you may, if you believe in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There is no such thing as half-hearted conversions. This man knew what God had said concerning our duty to him. You see, in Mark 12, 29 and 30, Jesus said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. I used to teach a Bible study just up the street from here in, in a house there on, uh, on the corner of East End and, uh, and Philadelphia. It's made out of rock. Anybody who drives in that area can see it. It's still there, that house. It's there. I used to call it the rock house, but I don't anymore because <laughs> that's not where you could buy rock. But anyway, it was, but it's, it's, made out, it's covered with rock. And, um, and I used to live there. I spent $25 a month. That was how much we spent for, uh, for rent. There were four of us. $100 a month. Think about that for a second, but don't get depressed. It's a long time ago. But while I was there, I was doing a Bible study. And uh, it's funny because that was long before we actually purchased this property. Marie and I drove by and this property uh, even before we were married. And I still remember saying, now that would be a great, little did I know that the Lord had prepared this place for us some years later. But while I was there, there was a guy who was in our Bible study. He was one of the guys who would uh, come for the Bible study on Monday night. His name was Charlie. And Charlie listened to the word. He eventually got saved by coming to the Bible study. And then a, a few years later, I was speaking to him. And Charlie said, you remember when you said that we were to love, that the Bible said we were to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? You remember that? I said, yeah, that's what the scripture says, Charlie. He goes, I had a real problem with that. He says, because I really love my children. He said, and the idea that I would love God who, whom I cannot see more than I would love the babies that were born to me, he said, was such a foreign thought. He said, I couldn't grasp it. He said, and I didn't realize that when I began to love God more and more, I was able to love my children with a deeper, purer, and more passionate love than ever before. He said, I finally discovered what that means. To love God with everything means to make others loved greatly also. I said, yeah, you put God first, and everything else flows from that, Charlie. And so this, this, this Ethiopian knew what Scripture said. You don't make half-hearted commitments to God. You don't say to God, I'll follow you uh, one or two or three days a week, but the other days are mine. I didn't marry my wife Marie with the idea that you would love me twice a week on a Wednesday and a Sunday. I married her with the understanding that together we would love each other every day of the week, every moment of every second of every day, that we were fully committed. That's what marriage is. And our relationship with the Lord is not half-hearted. It's not a kind of thing, well, I'll give you this much, but the rest belongs to me. And this Ethiopian knew that. To follow God requires a full commitment. And so as he hears the gospel, what doth hinder me from, uh, from being baptized? There's some water. In the midst of a desert, he finds some water. Here's some water. What's keeping me from it? And he says, you may, if you believe. With all of your heart. And he says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And before the entire entourage, he dedicates himself openly to the Lord. Now it says in verse 39, when, when they came up out of the water, 
the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So he went north. So Philip is immediately taken away from the man. The spirit who led Philip to the desert and the Ethiopian is now moving him to a different direction. He's taken away immediately. It's interesting how it says that, that he was caught away. That word caught is a very powerful word. It, it speaks of a forcible uh, removing. It's, it's basically a similar root word as to the word arpazo, which is used to speak of the rapture. It speaks of a sudden, a sudden movement, a sudden taken away. And so before everybody, he's baptized, but Philip is immediately taken away. And as he's gone, the Ethiopian, it says, begins to rejoice greatly in his salvation. Now, verse 40, Philip was found at Azotus. Azotus is 20 miles north of, of Gaza. He's preaching in the cities. He continues going north to a place called Caesarea. Now, nothing is mentioned of the Ethiopian again. But there's a church father, Arrhenius, who wrote that this Ethiopian had become a missionary to the Ethiopians. We don't know that for sure, but in church history that is traditionally believed. He became a missionary to the Ethiopians. What we do know is this. The Spirit prepared the man, and Philip brought that man to Jesus. The Spirit prepares you, but normally... Somebody else will bring you to the Lord. I believe that the Lord is still preparing people and that people need to hear that they can be saved. And I haven't gotten to the point where I think that we're completely lost as a nation. I believe that there are many who are waking up right now to see that the, the times are severe and that the church of all times should be loudly speaking of the love of Christ even at this moment. I believe that God is, is still working and that people are still being saved and God is still moving. And we need to believe that, I think, as a group because that's true. One last thing, we were in the Silicon Valley just last week. We were invited to go and speak uh, of the Jesus movement as it occurred in the early days. Uh, what, a brother by the name of Mike McClure has a, a fellowship there, um, a fellowship Calvary up there in San Jose, and he had asked me, along with a couple of other guys over the weeks, to come in to share, and so we did. We sat on the platform, and they asked questions. Before we spoke, we um, had Odin, Odin, who is a pioneer Mar Maranatha music worship leader, and, and then I went up with my wife, Marie, and we shared a little bit, and they were asking questions about the movement because they had seen the movie Jesus Revolution and were curious as to uh, people who were firsthand uh, in that, who experienced that and came out of that, and they wanted to know what, what, what our opinion was as it related to that, and so we were able to go there. And so he was sharing with me how that, in the midst of the Silicon Valley, where there is so much darkness, it's really kind of, I would call it the heart of darkness next to Hollywood, uh, in California, there's so much unbelief and so much, so much uh, hatred towards uh, faith in God. And yet, in the midst of the, the situation, the COVID situation, he said, people began to be hungry for truth, for hope. And his church, when COVID hit, his church had 800 members, which is a good work in the Silicon Valley. It now has 3,000 because... The Lord works through the darkness. People, guys, please don't let, the, don't let the enemy convince you there's no hope. Please don't. There is. There's always hope in Jesus Christ. There always is hope in Jesus Christ. You have not come to the end yet. So let's just be girded up. Let's share with people about who Jesus is and watch God move in Christ, there is always hope. There is always love. 
There's always faith. There's always joy. There can always be peace if we keep our eyes on him. This religious man, this Ethiopian, had gone to worship but left empty. He encounters a man on a road down going towards a desert. But this man brought the water of life, gives him the word, presents to him Jesus. His heart had been prepared. He brings him to faith. Here's some water. What hinders me from getting baptized? You can if you believe with all of your heart. Oh, I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He baptizes him. He goes back rejoicing. And again, church tradition says that many came to faith in Christ through this Ethiopian. One man in a desert can change many people's lives when he finds the living water. That is the truth. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. <laughs>